the hard work lies in being honest about the level of systemic racism, including in institutions like the media, definitely in places like sport. And until we unpack that, challenge that and make those workplaces truly inclusive, you can have brown people and disabled people and people who are queer and all at all intersections and say, we've got the diversity, but unless they're safe, to really do the work that they're hired to do, then there's no inclusion. What I try to implore everybody to do is to start their own reflections at a personal level and realise that anti-racism is a journey that we are all constantly on. You're not cured of racism. You don't just not see colour. Once we, in the first instance, accept that anti-racism is a journey, where there's not really a final destination, it's an ongoing journey and the, the work needs to continually be done. So you have that personal reckoning. Then you can look at your workplace and say, what can my workplace do to A, reflect Australian society by being both diverse and inclusive, but recognising that diversity alone doesn't fix racism, representation doesn't fix racism. But when you come to designing policies that may in some way attack racism, say from a health policy or some of the health dis disparities with First Nations people, there are so many different ways that racism manifests. Then when you have that intersectional lens, when you have people with lived experience at the table designing solutions, just like the voice is asking, the voice is merely asking, allow First Nations people, allow us to be at the decision making table, allow us to help craft policy and solutions. Some of the biggest errors um, I have witnessed in the diversity and inclusion space was from day dot. It's because they weren't diverse and inclusive when they were calling the shots. I think for myself, you know, it's not about just going and hiring Indigenous people. It's about making sure that you have a safe workplace for those people. It's about creating a really strong cultural commitment within your organisation to support these people when they enter the business as well. So I think, you know, depending on where you're located, there might be words that are specific to that place that can really help the culture change. So in my presentation today, I talked about bugaragara, lian, jadding, you know, just crucial words to changing a culture or to change a system of living. Training is essential because unless people are trained as to how to manage and make organisations inclusive and safe, um, then people will just come in and they'll leave. If there's no psychological safety and support and a pipeline to success, people won't stay in an organisation like that. People who are embarking upon change will try to paint a vision of what they're trying to achieve. And the trouble is that often those who are being presented with the vision cannot see it. So what you do is you look to expand the way in which individuals within an organisation or other key stakeholders are able to see things. Uh, not just with, say, one or two parts of a spectrum where the rest of it is invisible to them, but with a broad capacity. And once you do that and you improve the capacity of people to see things in a more full sense, then the vision will also be clearer to them in all of its different parts. And that's how I think you bring people most effectively along on a journey of change. It seems to me this problem of hate speech against women speaks both persuasively and poignantly to some of the things that might be ailing our soul as a nation and indeed as a planet and as a race. Having said this, online hate and anger, like most aspects of systemic discrimination, manifest and are experienced in a range of ways and it's important to keep this in mind. Significantly, women themselves experience online hate and anger intersectionally along additional axes of systemic oppression that include race, colour, religion, sexuality, gender identity, disability and so on. Women typically feel threatened and humiliated by occurrences of hate speech and they adapt their own behaviours accordingly. They police their identities, their speech and their movements or they leave online and offline spaces and disengage entirely from public life. There's many sayings around power and so power doesn't uh, exceed, it doesn't hand over the keys. You know, you have to fight for important social change. The more important it is, the more pushback you can probably expect. Um, over time, you know, we, uh, concepts and movements and issues are normalised and therefore, you know, um, 
time tends to bring a country along. So for example, when we talk about the marriage equality, you know, 20 years uh, previous was a huge challenge, but over time, you know, the, the country tends to come to these times. So timing is one of the key factors. If you are one of the first people advocating for something really important, if you're one of the first people talking about the voice or the Uluru Statement or uh, truth and justice and treaty for First Nations peoples, then you have more resistance than what we have today in 2023. Um, my advice is firstly, of course, you have to expect that that is going to occur. Uh, that uh, I think it tests the depth of your belief in the, the nature of change that you want to see happen and the extent to which you believe the country requires that. I think that gives us fuel for all of us in the community and NGO sector. Uh, and finally, a collectivism is the most important. You know, the more people who come on board with an issue, the more intellectual credibility uh, and capability that we are able to acquire, uh, and of course, a mass of voices in a democracy like Australia still is the ultimate barometer of where the country is going to head.